data science has been becoming a growing profession and is also the heart of many organizations. That's why Data Science Portugal was born. The first community created by data scientists for data scientists. DSPT wants to gather anyone who works in the field and chat about any topic over this great subject. All members from our team are committed to make sure that the data science field evolves in a healthier and stronger way. To ensure that the focus is on sharing knowledge, we guarantee that our stage is not a place that supports any commercial or recruitment content, and our kind speakers are committed to share their experience for free. We want you. Let's do bigger things together. Join us at any event all around Portugal or online. Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar. My name is Isabel. I have with me Mafalda. Hey Mafalda. Hey. And we are going to be our hostess for today. So as the agenda is going to be as usual, we're going to do a small opening. Then we're going to pass to our talk with Rafael today, followed by a short Q&A. And after it, don't, after, don't drop off the call. We are going to do the networking session in this platform. So as you guys already know, the SPT is an informal community for data science enthusiasts in which we are always trying to improve and do better events. And for that, we kind of have a, a do's and don't philosophy. So we do promote knowledge sharing, we organize open events, we promote networking, but please do not uh, try selling our shameless promotion. Once you are in, your, in our stage, you're kind of different from a sponsoring and please do not do hiring. So have that in mind when you fill our form for call for proposals. So if you have something, if you have a team, if you have any type of product that you want to share with us or the community, please do it and we'll get back to you in a few days. So where are we? You can find us in Aveiro, Braga, Coimbra, Lisboa and Porto. And right now you can also find us online on our YouTube channel. These are our current sites, Data Science Portugal, where you can find the future events by data science communities and other communities also. Also, you can find job offers and much more. This is our social network community. You, ha you have Slack, Facebook, Meetup and LinkedIn. Please contact us if you have any doubts about data related and join us. I want to thank you, Bosch, for sponsor this webinar because this sponsorship enabled us to do this webinar. <laughs> About the step Q&A, please ma make the questions in this platform, WebEx, in the area where you can find the, the, the button Q&A. With further to add, I want to present Rafael Teixeira. He is a master's student at the University of Aveiro. And uh, he has a, a, a talk about non-intrusive non uh, load mo monitoring, um, a way to, to reduce energy consumption. And hello, Rafael, the stage is yours. <laughs> so I will start by sharing uh... The, my screen for my presentation. So give me a minute. I believe you are you are now seeing my my presentation. Am I correct? Yes. Okay. So sorry about the cars. I don't know if you are hearing them, but they are being very loud. But let's start. So hello everyone. Today I'll be talking about non-intrusive load monitoring. And the plan for the talk is as follows. We will start by explaining the importance of non-intrusive load monitoring. Then we will take a look at the characteristics of the NILM task and at the state of the art. After that, I will present the work we have been developing as well as the contributions it brings to this area. To sum up, I will propose what I believe to be the ideal NILM solution and how we pretend to get there. But before we dive deeper, we should formally define the task at hand. That being said, NIL is the task that aims to disaggregate the energy consumed by the entire household into the energy consumed by each appliance, using only readings obtained by one meter that captures the aggregated readings. 
in practice and looking at the plot presented, what this means is that the system needs to be capable of generating the green and orange lines that in this case represent an electric heat pump and a car charger from the blue line that represents the consumption of the entire household. Some subtasks of NILM have also been proposed, such as appliance state detection, where instead of disaggregating the load, we classify the appliances as on or off. These subtasks are a good starting point since they are easier to solve. Now that we, we know the task at hand, it is important to understand why it needs to be solved. And the main reason is the unsustainable increase in household energy consumption that already accounts for 30% of the total energy consumed in the, in the world. By taking a look at the two plots, we can see that most countries rely on fossil fuels to produce the majority of, the, of their energy. This creates many environmental concerns. One way we can reduce this consumption is based on the education of the consumer, as most of us understand too little about what makes up our energy bill. The education process consists on providing the consumer with detailed energy bills that give tips on how to reduce them and also appliance level information. To better understand this, I like to use an analogy. So, imagine that our energy consumption becomes our groceries consumptions. The implications of this idea is that when we go to the supermarket, we don't know the value of each individual product and we don't pay each time we go to the supermarket. Instead, at the end of each month, we will get a bill at home with the value of the total of the groceries we consumed. This makes it very hard to understand how we can save on groceries. And in an attempt to solve this problem, a solution was presented, smart meters. These devices provide consumers with detailed information on the aggregated readings, allowing consumers to see the energy consumption more frequently than the monthly bill. If we fall back to the supermarket analogy, this represents a change where instead of paying the monthly total of groceries, we start paying each time we go to the supermarket. A better way to understand how to save money, but not the easiest. Another solution with the intent to mitigate the flaws of smart meters is the use of plug meters. The plug meters provide appliance level information, meaning that we can know what each appliance is consuming at a given time, but have the downside of the fact that we need a plug meter for each appliance we want to monitor. This makes the adoption cost very high and the hassle to implement it discouraging. In our analogy, this means that in order for us to know what each product costs, we need to buy a scanner and the scanner only functions for one product in each trip to the supermarket. The more scanners we have, the more products we know the cost. But if we are being honest, no one wants to carry 20 scanners for a grocery run. And the same applies to our energy bills. We want to know the information, but the hassle of getting the scanners and their cost is not worth it. And that's why NIL is the ideal solution. It provides appliance level information using only the aggregated readings. To finalize my analogy on groceries, this means that for each grocery run, we only need to scan the bill we get at the end in order to know what each product costs. Now that we understand why we need NILM, let's take a deeper look at the task at hand and also at what is the state of the art. Let's start by looking at the available data. Since, as I mentioned before, we are limited to use only the information from the aggregated consumption. This restriction makes the task harder, but we still have some options to choose from. Depending on the rate at which we record the aggregated consumption, we can obtain different information. And according to the amount of information extracted, we can divide the sampling frequencies. The first one is the low frequency sampling with frequencies below 1 Hz. This present a harder way to distinguish between appliances. They compensate, although, by having the lowest implementation cost. As previously mentioned, smart meters 
have already been widely deployed and are able to provide them. One other feature to pay attention to is the fact that it is noticeably easier to record and store the aggregated and appliance data. So, researchers tend to record more measures than just the apparent power, like voltage, phase, reactive power, etc. These different measures can also help us distinguish between appliances. The medium frequency samples help us identify appliances like power supplies that generate non-sinusoidal consumptions. Their consumptions introduce higher frequency components to the signal, called harmonics. These frequencies are multiples of the fundamental frequency, which is 60 Hz. In order to capture these harmonics, we need frequencies higher than 120 Hz. And, depending on the harmonic we want to reach, we might need higher frequencies. For example, if we want to reach the fifth harmonic, which has 300 Hz, we need a 600 Hz sampling frequency following the nyquist shannon theorem. And finally, we have the high frequency sampling that considers any frequency above 1000 Hz. These frequencies help us identify the startup's gen events generated by appliances. These transient events are characteristic of the appliance type and last at most a couple of milliseconds, hence the high frequencies needed. This option is the most expensive one as there is a need for specific hardware capable of sampling at such high rates. So, between these three options, what are we going to use? There are a couple of things we should keep in mind. The first one is, the higher the frequency we use, the higher the cost of implementation will be. And the second one is that we need a solution with low cost, or we will end up like the plug meters. And since the smart meters are widely deployed and they are capable of low frequency sampling, the low frequency sampling has a much lower implementation cost. So when we end up looking at the cost benefit of the three options, the low frequency has the better one, making it the option to be chosen. Now that we understand the limitations of the data and what is the data that we are actually going to use, let's take a look at the datasets containing it. A dataset for NILM must contain not only the aggregated data, but also the appliance level information. The latter is needed to train and validate the models we are proposing. There are several datasets proposed for NILM, but most of them lack in some criteria to be considered good datasets. So, a good dataset is defined by first having the most low frequency readings possible. This means having more than just the apparent power. This is important because these readings will help us overcome the limitations of low frequency sampling we have mentioned before by providing a bigger plane for feature extraction. If we take a look at the plot, we have three types of readings, the apparent power, the active power, and reactive power. And if we pay attention, we notice that not all activations registered in the apparent power are seen in the active or reactive power. This means that the algorithm can use more than just the power spike and the duration as feature extraction, but also the relation between spikes in different measures, making it easier to distinguish between appliances. One other characteristic is having as many houses as possible, since we need to be able to generalize to different appliance brands and usage patterns. As we can see in the plot, the three fridges shown have similar power consumption, but have some differences in their cycles. The blue fridge presents two switching states, either a lower or bigger cycle. The orange and green have only one cycle repeatedly, but the time between cycles and the energy consumed are different, and that's why it is important to have these multiple houses with different appliance brands and usage patterns. And we have also the recording period, that is also important since we need to generalize to seasonal changes in the appliance usage. As an example, the electric heat pump usage during October 
is very different from the usage during December. During October, a relatively warm month, the heat pump rarely works. But for the same week in December, a cold month, the heat pump worked very frequently. The last characteristic, but not least, is a good variety of appliances. So we can validate that our algorithm learns the correct features that allow to identify different appliance types. That is, appliance with two states or with constant consumption, with multiple states and even with varying consumption. As you can see in the plot, we have two different appliances. The car charger is a two-state appliance. It is either on or off. And the heat pump is a varying consumption appliance, as we can see by the spikes we have around 12.30. That being said, let's take a look at the available datasets. Unfortunately, all of them present a trade-off between the number of houses or the period of recording and the amount of readings recorded. The only common feature is a good variety of appliances. For example, the read dataset records six houses using 24 meters with high frequency sampling, but has a low recording period of only three to 19 days. The data port contains more than 60 houses, but only records the apparent power. The UK Dale follows the same path. It records for a long period of time, five houses, but only contains the apparent power. The MPDS2 records many appliances during two years with many readings, but only for one house. And the RED records 12 appliances of three houses, but only records the aggregated power and only records during six months. In our experiments, we use a dataset that is still being built and the UK Dale dataset, since there is a, mod a lot of models tested in it. So, at this point, we know what is NILM, why it is important, and what data we have available to solve the task. The only thing left is to take a look at the proposals made to solve it. The first one was proposed by Hart in the 90s, and it used edge detection and the duration of the, of the activation to classify the appliances. Since then, there have been many proposals, and they are divided into two categories. The first one is the probabilistic models. They are the most researched category and are, in their majority, hidden Markov models and their variants. A hidden Markov model is a Markov model whose states in the image x1 to x3 aren't directly observed. Instead, each state is characterized by a probability distribution function. This function models the observations obtained corresponding to that state. In NILM, the states are modeled to be the states of the appliance, and the observations are either the energy consumed by the appliance or the state they are, like on or suspended, etc. To define these initial probabilities, states, and observations, we need expert knowledge about the corresponding appliance, which makes them harder to work with. Another disadvantage is the quadratic growth associated with the number of appliances being disaggregated. The other category is the machine learning models that only recently got a lot of attention and mainly because of the success obtained on other tasks like natural language processing and image classification. There is a wide variety of proposed models and because of that, they are divided into the supervised models and unsupervised models. The supervised solutions are the most explored. And in this category, we find that the most successful implementations are deep neural networks. The state of the art is obtained by networks that use convolutions like sec to point or sec to sec and recurrent units, uh, yeah, recurrent units like window group and bidirectional LSTMs. As an example, we will briefly talk about sec to point and sec to sec two architectures that only differ on the last layer and the task they solve. SEC2SEC -sec predicts for each example in the input window the energy being consumed, and SEC2Point only predicts the middle value of the input window. This makes SEC2SEC -sec a sequence prediction model and SEC2Point a point prediction model. The SEC2Point 
implementation, shows a small improvement when compared to site to site. This indicates that we should start by creating an algorithm that focus in obtaining one value at a time as it makes it easier a easier task to solve. As for unsupervised models, the main reason people use them is because they don't need labeled data, making the data collection cheaper as we only need the aggregated data. The only good results obtained in this area were obtained through clustering algorithms such as KNUS neighbor and are obtained in controlled environments using high frequency sampling. In the k nearest neighbors algorithms, we build clusters of examples, such as the blue and red clusters in the image. And when we want to classify a new entry, such as the green point, we search for the closest cluster according to the closest neighbors. The closest neighbors can be obtained using different distance metrics. The most famous in time series is the dynamic time warping, but the most common in k nearest neighbors is the use of the Euclidean distance. After the initial clusters are built, researchers need to manually label each one of them as the respective appliance. This means that there is an extra step in the training of these models that requires some domain knowledge. So the takeaways we can take from the state of the art are even though hidden Markov models have been widely researched, the results obtained have already been suppressed, so suppressed yes, by the machine learning models. If we take a look at the graph, we can see three probabilistic models. The combinatorial optimization in green, the factorial hidden Markov models in or darker orange, and the approximate factorial hidden Markov model in yellow, light yellow actually. And when they are compared to the other four machine learning models, they present errors of more than the double. This is for a, sim a single fridge. This, along with the disadvantages mentioned before, makes them no longer a viable option. As for the k nearest neighbors, they can only obtain good results when high frequency sampling is used and under controlled environments. This makes the viable options the supervised models that obtain the state of the art recurring to models such as convolutional neural networks and recurrent neural networks. Lastly, we can state that the NILM task hasn't been solved yet. So, at this point, we have the basis of my work. With this in mind, we defined what the new approaches we could try. We noticed a couple of things in the state of the art. The first was the fact that no one had proposed a successful recurrent neural network with more than a couple of recurrent layers. And the second was that only a few of the proposed models used some source of, of future extraction, meaning that most models used the time series directly. With these two observations in mind, we decided to see what had been proposed for other time series the problems that we could apply to NILM. During this search, besides information about these two areas, we found a residual network that obtained good results across different tasks. So we decided to also experiment with that network and see the results it could obtain. So starting from the future extractors, we ended up by considering three options. Either we don't use feature extraction, we use discrete wavelet transforms, or we use a recent feature extractor based on random convolutional kernels named the rocket. Since we are using recurrent neural networks and convolutional neural networks that are both able to take into account the order of the data, we decided to give them the raw data. The two feature extractors are going to be used on a multi-layer perceptron. The idea behind experimenting with the feature extraction is to understand if there is added value in using it or if the models can discover the, the same, if not better, features using only the raw data. So to understand the why we chose discrete wavelet transforms, we need to understand the signal we are processing. With different appliances being turned on and off, 
there are frequency changes in the signal. But more than just finding these changes happening, it is important to know when they happened so we better understand the signal or the, the sample of the signal. The discrete wavelet transforms allow us to do just that. They do it by discreetly sampling wavelets from a signal. Since the wavelets are not infinite like sinusoidal waves, they are able to provide us with temporal resolution. The figure shows five representations of the SHIRP signal being decomposed by different levels of a wavelet. Each level represents the SHIRP signal in a different frequency subband. We will use the approximation coefficients to extract statistical features that we will then feed to the multilayer perceptron. The reasoning behind using them is that different appliance activations might generate different fingerprints in the approximation coefficients, and the multilayer perceptron will use them to classify the appliances. The rocket feature extractor is a recent algorithm. It takes, the kernel, it takes the kernels used in convolutional neural networks that have been proved to extract features with great success in different areas, and instead of generating a full network and optimizing the kernels through backpropagation, they generate a big number of random kernels, minimum being 10,000, and assume that the feature extraction they do provide a feature space good enough for the time series task at hand. After the feature extraction made by the random kernels, the authors recommend that we use an algorithm such as the ridge classifier to solve the task. But if we want to visualize this in another way, it is like having a non-trainable layer with 10,000 kernels in a convolutional neural network that only has one layer. We can exp expand this network by adding trainable layers in front of it or by using other algorithms. That being said, as you can deduce, we are using three types of deep neural networks. The recurrent neural networks that are characterized by their special neurons that use the previous output of them as the input in order to capture temporal features of the data. We are using, also using the convolutional neural networks that were designed for image classification tasks, but as seen in natural language processing and other time series tasks can also capture temporal features. And last but not least, we are also using a multilayer perceptron that are composed of dense layers that can capture actual temporal features of the data. That's why we use the feature extraction. With these three models, we can validate many things. The first one, as I mentioned before, is the added value of feature extraction. The second is the added value of deeper recurrent neural networks in the known task, and finally, is the comparison between the state-of-the-art networks and a residual network proposed for general time series classification. As a baseline for the results, we decided to implement two simple recurrent neural networks named SimpleGrew and LSTM. The only difference between them is the type of recurrent layer they implement. Like the name says, one uses gated recurrent units and the other uses long short-term memory. The objective here is to see if the, there is a different or a noticeable difference actually in the both layers and to check what is the better uh, neuron. The model started with only two layers, the GRU or LSTM layers and the dense layer for classification, but they were overfitting the training data. So we decided to add a new dense layer. And even though it helped the generalization, it wasn't enough. So we added a dropout layer, which helped the model stop overfitting. The attention layer was used to validate the possible added value of attention. If successful, we will use it in deeper networks. The deep grew was created in order to try to create a successful deep recurrent neural network. The model started as four gated recurrent unit layers, followed by a dense layer, but was suffering from the vanishing gradient problem, so we added another dense layer in the end. And since the model was still suffering from the vanishing gradient problem, we experimented with leaky relu and the dropout that ended up solving the problem. 
The convolutional neural network we are using was proposed by Wang, and the reason we decided to try it in NIL was the good results it obtained in other time series tasks. The network is composed by three blocks of convolutions, where the input of the block is summed to the output. This creates what is called a residual network and avoids the vanishing gradient problem. The model, as is, is overfitting the training data, so we are going to add dropout layers in between the blocks to see if we can improve the results. The multilayer perceptron is very similar to a denoising autoencoder, but instead of predicting the whole sequence of the input, it will work the same way as the previous algorithms and only predict the last element of the sequence. So, we have the results, but before we talk about them, I need to mention some things. The task we are solving now is the appliance activation detection, which means that we only know, we are only trying to know if the device is on or off. The idea is to find a good model in this subtask and then adapt it to the disaggregation task. And the training data contains a week of data of four different months, and the test data contains a week of data for a scene month, not overlapping with the week we are using in the training data, and a week of, a day of data for a month that was never seen. The idea is to validate that the model uh, generalizes well to unseen months. And the preliminary results are positive, as they indicate that the deep group and ResNet are capable of doing just that. As for the simple group and simple LSTM, even though they obtain reasonable results in the training data, approximately 0.70, they are incapable of generalizing for unseen months, as they ended up with 0.20, around 0.20, in the test data. The multilayer perceptron obtained good results, but inferior to the ones obtained by the deep group and ResNet. This might be because the discrete wavelet transforms don't capture the correct features that allow a good generalization, or because the multilayer perceptron still needs some tuning. As for the differences obtained when classifying different appliances, we can see that the car charger overall had overall worse results than the heat pump. The results obtained are counterintuitive, since the car charger was supposed to be an easier appliance, only having two states. But there are other reasons that can justify the results. The results can be either because of the time window we passed to the models, since a normal charging cycle lasts at least an hour and the windows we presented contained only two minutes of data, meaning that the algorithm never sees a full cycle, or because of the unbalanced data, since there are usually only one to two charges per day that are a lot more negative examples than positive ones. The objective now is we continue to experiment with these models changing the layers and hyperparameters in order to increase the scores obtained and understand what are the important features to them. So we are reaching the end. I've told you what is NILM, why it is important and why what we are doing. But there is a thing missing. I haven't told you what is the final objective. To do so, it's easier if I start by explaining the different steps we should take. The first one is developing a model capable of correctly disaggregating one appliance. For the context, we are still in this phase as none of the proposed models achieves a good Matthews correlation coefficient. After that, we want to find a model capable of disaggregating different appliances separately. What this means is that without changing the hyperparameters, the same model can be trained for every appliance and achieve good results. Our results indicate that we still fail on this task too, by looking at the differences between the heat pump and the car charger. And finally, we want a model that can identify several appliances simultaneously, something similar to what YOLO does to images. And as an ending note, I wanted to remind you that even though the first model was proposed more than 20 years ago, 
Only recently, the interest in NILM researched. There is still a lot of work to be done in this area. And besides the residential buildings applications of NILM, there is also the applications for industrial and commercial buildings that I didn't cover. Hopefully, we can implement a system that will help us reduce energy consumption and with that reduce the consumption of fossil fuels. Thank you all for listening and this was my presentation. Thank you, Rafael. Let's just wait for a few minutes. If anyone has any question, we are going to go through the Q&A unless you have any further question that you want to ask, and then you can raise your hand and place your question in person. So no one? Okay, then let's start with the, the questions that we already have. So the first one, what reason to use DWT instead of Fourier transform? So as I mentioned uh, during my presentation, the discrete wavelet transforms allow us to have um, uh, time dimension data. And Fourier transforms, even though they have high resolution in the frequency spectrum, they don't allow us to know when the activation happened. So when we are watching a, a sliding window, if the activation was happening in the beginning of the time window, or if it was happening in the end of the time window, we would have the same output. But for the model, it is totally different if the, the activation happened in the beginning of the, the, the time window or in the end. Because if we have a big time window, say an hour, we need to know if the activation was near the beginning because the appliance might already be turned off, or if it was near the end where the appliance was still on. And that was the main reason we used discrete wavelet transforms, was because we needed that um, time domain knowledge in order to, to have a good classification. Okay. Uh, the second question is, is there any reason for co combination models and variants to perform poorly re regarding the M ML models? The, the main reason is because if we think about hidden Markov models and their variants and the combinatorial optimization, they rely heavily on the fact that there is a, a predefined state and that the models don't change the state. Um, what I mean by this is that if we model for one specific fridge, for example, that was the, the appliance that I showed in the, in the plot, the fridge that I showed you had like three to four states with the spikes. So if I, if I use the, the plot, it's easier to explain, but let's try to understand the the meaning behind this. Uh, okay, I'm okay. So we can see here that we can consider, for example, three states. Let's assume that we have the normal state, the off state, and uh, the spike state. We have three states, but the model needs to guess if we are changing between one of these three states. And even though the probabilities are very good, they tend to miss because, as we can see, there is no reproducible way of learning the spikes, as we have a big spike here, but a lower one here in the middle of the activation, and in the other activation, it is a lower spike. So even though we modeled three states, the appliance ends up having more than three states, and that's why they end up, end up um, losing the to the machine learning models because they can't actually use more than the states we provide them. And if we provide them, let's say 10 states and let the algorithm figures out what states they need, they will have end up having a big um, uh, classification time because of the, the exponential growth they have. Thank you. And 
let me just remind everyone that if you guys want to place your question in place, just let us know. So, uh, why did you use the MCC instead of the conventional precision and recall metrics? So the I was going to use the precision and recall, but uh, my um, my mentor uh, Mario uh, explained me that uh, MCC actually works well even for unbalanced data. So we wouldn't end up having the the problems of thinking that the model is actually classifying well, but in reality, he was just predicting positive or negative examples. So the MCC shows us um, a good balance between the the correct classifications and the the weights or the num the number of examples we have either on the positive and negative values. Okay, thank you. Do you believe that a single model could be used in all? the different appliance? Um, I believe so. And we are actually discussing a new implementation where the idea is, um, as I, st I told you during the, the presentation, the our models lack on the capacity to, um, to classify both the car charger and the heat pump because of the different timing cycles. So we are trying to build a network that uh, receives different cycle uh, time windows with different um, with different sampling rates, and they proceed to make a classification based on those three or four or five time windows in order to mitigate these flaws. So there is still work to be done, but I believe that it is possible if we can implement an actual uh, network that uses different time windows simultaneously. That's really interesting. So, and the last question for our, from our Q and A is: Does the brand of the appliances has a direct impact on the algorithm results? Um, I can't state that right now, at least on my uh, on my results, since I'm starting from the the step one. That is, it actually being able to classify for a single appliance and for um, for different months. But the the results I've seen are not directly related to the, the appliance brand, but there are brands and the most of the appliances with different ratings tend to have different uh, consumption patterns. And that is the, the one of the things that we should see if there is an actual impact. But to the date, I haven't found any article talking about this. If no one has any further questions, I think I'm going to ask the, the last one that is mine. Um, so what do you think, what do you believe that would be your next steps in order for you to deep dive on your research? Okay, so the, I told you about the data set that is already being built, which the objective is giving me those appliance readings that I told, told you about that give uh, an easier way using low frequency sampling to to distinguish the appliances. So the first step is starting to work with that data set with multiple appliances and multiple houses, and then is um, experimenting or understanding why the models are failing to to um, transfer the learning or not transfer the learning, but why they are failing to, with the same hyperparameters, classify different appliances. So once we understand what is the reason why the models are failing, we can further research that area and try to uh, try to come up with a, a, a better model that resolves the, the task. And after that, we need to build upon that and try to build that single model that single-handedly tackles all the appliances. Very interesting. Uh, we have one uh, another question is how big is the data set? Can you comment on most appliance in use? So the the data set, I believe we are talking about the one that's being built. Um, right now, it's still in early phase. It has four months of data collected. 
there are different appliances. Um, most of the houses have between um, six and 10 appliances, I, if I'm not uh, incorrect. And the, the number of houses is still rising. So we are still implementing the, the data set. And the idea is to continuously be adding more houses as, uh, as we prove that the, the models are improving by having the data collected. And after that, the, the sky is the limit. As long as it, that is funding, we the objective conti is to continue in uh, getting the reads and expanding the number of houses and appliances. Any more questions, everyone? You can talk if you want. Yeah. <laughs> I think so. Well, if not, we can wrap it up and then during the networking, you can place your questions directly to the to your to our speaker, Rafael. So once again, thank you, Havel. Thank you for being here and show us your research. It was really interesting. Like I said, I saw from all the questions that you got. I'm I'm the one thanking it. It was a, a wonderful opportunity. So I'm going to ask our technical guy to change our screens to let me present it, please. Okay. okay. Here we go. So once again, do not forget regarding our call for proposals. We really want to know what you guys are up to or your latest research or even share with us the topics that you'd like to see a webinar at or even maybe a tutorial. Uh, do not forget to, to submit your, your survey, at our, at your, your answers to our survey. It's really helpful. It's really help, helpful for us and we can start improving and do more and do better uh, on these webinars. So many thanks for you guys, but don't go away right now because we are going to be doing the networking here. So like you like you're seeing, we are starting to, to use this platform and we want to make sure that everything goes smoothly and well with it. So also give us feedback on the networking component. But thank you. <laughs>